Open with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 1. We're going to look specifically at verses 16 and 17. But I'm going to back up and read beginning at verse number 1. All the way through verse 17. Romans 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I've often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, and in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. And now we come to our text for the morning. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Speak, O Lord, and build your church. Fill us with your glory. And may your glory spread to all the nations. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. If we were to ask the typical Pasco County or Pinellas County resident, what is Christianity? What kind of answer do you think we would get? Or we to maybe specify the question a little bit. What, what is the essence of Christianity? What, what is the heart of Christianity? We would probably get answers something like, well, we should be like Jesus. Or we should obey the Ten Commandments. Or we should always vote Republican. I was just making sure y'all were. I was just making sure y'all 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 were paying attention, right? Well, listen. Let me say this, okay? Two of those three things are great, okay? The other one can be debated. But certainly, is not as important. It certainly, is not a matter of Christianity versus non-Christianity. Okay, I'll let you figure out which two of those are. Two of them you should absolutely 100% do. You should be like Jesus. You should attempt to follow the Ten Commandments. But, but listen, neither of those things capture the essence of what Christianity is. Paul in his beginning to this letter to the book of Romans is highlighting for us drawing out for us what is the essence of Christianity. And you know what he says over and over and over again? The essence of Christianity is the Gospel. 
It is the gospel. Now, what is gospel? We've mentioned it a bunch of times in here. We've never actually defined it. The word itself is very interesting. It comes from uh, two Greek words. Uh, it's euangelion. Right? The word you, you, you might understand this from if we eulogize somebody, what are we doing? We're saying something good about them. Right? Even if we don't think there's anything good to say, it's what we do when someone passes away. Right? We, we, you means good. Now in the Greek, angelos or, or angelon is, is the word for messenger. We get the idea, uh, by the way, the, the, the English word angel from angelos, right? But when you see the word angelos, it, it's not just talking about, you know, whatever our picture of, you know, modern perception of what an angel is. The, the word actually means message or messengers. And so when you put it together, gospel is literally good message or good news. And so folks, at its base, at its essence, Christianity is about news. Joy-inducing good news. It's a message. And that's important. Because every other religion... It goes beyond a message into, here's what you must do, right? Rather than news, it is, okay, this is super cheesy, right? But you're going to remember it. Instead of news, it is do's, right? Here's what you must do. You want to be with God? You want to be near God? You want God to accept you? You got to do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Christianity comes along and says, what is at the heart, what is at the essence, is it's a news story, it's a message, and it is a really good message. Because it is a message that is centered around a person, Jesus Christ, who because He came and was made like us in the flesh and died and rose again, it, it, it's not about dues. It's about we receive the message by faith. That is the heart of Christianity. The essence of Christianity, I should say. It is a good message. It is good news. And so Paul says, because it is good news, I'm eager to preach it. I'm eager to come to Rome and even preach it to those of you who are in church. You've already heard it before. Because he wanted to see new converts outside of the church. And he wanted to see those inside the church respond in faith to the good news. They needed to continue hearing it. And Paul was so convinced of its goodness, of its uniqueness, that he was eager to preach it. But why eager? What is it about the Gospel that would make us eager to proclaim it? Well, you see, the Gospel, as Paul understood it, is not just news. Like we're used to receiving information. You know, it used to be the black and white newspaper that would show up at your door every day. Now we hop online and we pull up a news story and there you got the headline, good news! And you read all about it, right? But there's something inherently different about this news. Not only is it good, not only is it uniquely good, but Paul says this message is power. It's power. So what he says in verse number 16, it is the power of God. Now, I did a little research on this just because it, it's, uh, it was curious. It's fun. You know, philosophy defines power as the ability to bring about change or to prevent change from happening. Right? You know what I mean? Like, like if... If I'm in a situation and I don't like it, power is I have the ability to change the circumstances. I have the ability, the ability to change people's minds. I have the ability to, to change what is going on so that I'm more comfortable. Or if change is coming and I don't like the change, real power is the ability to stop that change, right? So I am not affected by it. That's real power. So with, with that as the definition, I, I, I was just curious, like what today might we consider real power. Well, maybe governments, but governments tend to come and go and there's always interplay and, 
and push and pull. And I don't know that that's really the emphasis anymore. Some people say education is power, and that's, that's all very true. But, but there's one thing that we always kind of revert to to say this is the thing that has so much power it makes the world go round. And what is it? It's money, isn't it? I mean, isn't that kind of the essence of power in our, uh, in our culture? Like, you know, men like Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk worth hundreds of billions of dollars, and why are they amassing? Why do we feel the need to amass money? It was because we have power through that money to affect change, to make me more comfortable, to prevent change from happening. That might make me uncomfortable. If you have enough power, you can affect a lot of change, both for good or bad. You have enough power, you can influence governments with your resources. Money is power. And I think it's always been that way. But, but sometimes throughout history, these, there are these other things that kind of pop up and, and they're, they're, so, um, they're so powerful that, that even money seems to recede into the background a little bit. And so a few generations ago, there was a power unleashed on the world that would, that, that, that would change everything. July 16th, 1945, a team of U.S. scientists based in Los Alamos, New Mexico, conducted an experiment, what their leader, J. Robert Oppenheimer, had named the Trinity Test. And they were going to detonate a new kind of bomb, one that they hoped would bring about the end of World War II. And there was a young physicist who was, um, who was present during the demonstration of the the, the explosion of this nuclear bomb in New Mexico. His name was Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman said this. He was there. He witnessed the power of this explosion. And afterwards, it profoundly affected him. Witnessing this kind of destructive power. Here's what he said. My first reaction after I was finished with this thing was, it's useless to make anything. I remember being in New York with my mother in a restaurant right after. I, I would see people building a bridge and I would say, they don't understand. I really believe that it was senseless to make anything because it would all be destroyed very soon anyway. The creation of nuclear weaponry had given those people who possessed it a power that was previously unimaginable. In the face of such power, those who had witnessed it, it was like despair. What are we even doing? We're just going to kill ourselves. We can't control such power. We can't be trusted with such power. That bomb's explosive power was so great, by the way, that not only did it bring about the end of the war more quickly than it probably would have on its own, but it also changed world politics. That, that's, it's the reason why we ended up in a cold war with Russia. Incredible power. But if we were to go back even further to Paul's day and say to the people around Rome or in Jerusalem or anywhere in the known world and said, what is power to you? They would have probably had one answer, and that answer was Rome. Rome. They, through sheer military might, had blitzed through much of the known world. They were the dominant force on the planet. No one could stand against their military might. They had vast resources. They come in, the historian Tacitus said, <laughs> Rome comes in, and, and when they're conquering a place, they create a desert, and they call it peace. They just obliterated everybody. They were the ultimate power on the earth. They created the largest and longest lasting empire the world has ever known. But as powerful as money and bombs or vast empires may seem, there is a power against which none of them can stand. And that is the power of the Gospel. Because folks, the good news is not merely words. It is the very power of God to bring about your salvation. It is the power of the kingdom of God breaking into our reality. And get this, if power means you have the ability to affect change, you cannot be stopped, then there is no power that rivals the power of the gospel 
it cannot be stopped. Rome tried. And in the end, even the great Roman Empire bowed to the power of the Gospel. Hell itself would try. But Jesus said, I will build my church. And listen, not even the power of self-will or self-deception can stand against the power of the Gospel. For God has said, those whom I call, I justify. Folks, there is no power that rivals the power of the Gospel. Because it's not merely the ability to access power. It is not as if through this Gospel we have access to power. No, no, no. It is more than that. The Gospel is power. Which prompted one author to say, which means when I believe it, when I hear it and understand it, when I grasp it, when I grasp its meanings, its words, to the degree that I actually get this Gospel into my life, the power of God is coursing through me. It is the power of God in verbal form. It is the power of God in human language. There is nothing like it. There is no power that can rival it. There is no government that can withstand it. There is no bomb that can destroy it. The gates of hell itself are overwhelmed by the power of the gospel. And so certain was Paul about the power of the Gospel that he says, I'm not ashamed. I am not ashamed. You know what it is to feel ashamed? Here's part of what I think this means. When Paul says, I I am not ashamed, part of what he means is, that even when you experience the power of the Gospel, you understand very clearly just how offensive the message really is. Paul's like, I I know, this is power. This message offends people. And the reality is it offends everybody, doesn't it? Everybody is offended by this message. You you might have someone who who says, man, I'm offended because I don't like someone telling me that I'm a sinner. I've been the good sister all my life. I had a good family. I've tried really hard. I go to church. It's just too negative. right? The message is just too hard. Other people look at it and go, it's just too easy. I mean, you mean to tell me that I've been the good one all my life that some murderer on death row can just believe and he gets all the same benefits? Like, like he just gets God just like that? It's just too easy. You mean I don't have to do anything? Some people say it's just too childish. I mean, we're just far more sophisticated these days than to believe in such fairy tale nonsense. You want me to believe in a Jewish carpenter who lived 2,000 years ago and he's going to save my soul? How foolish. That's why Paul says this, this is foolishness to the Greek and a stumbling block to the Jew. Why? Because the gospel universally offends everybody. It universally offends everybody. One author said, here's the first century carpenter. He dies, he rises again, and everything changes if you believe that. If you believe in that, then you're in. If you don't believe in that, you're out. My goodness, the clarity of it. The simplicity of it. Don't you see? Liberal or conservative, blue collar or white collar, north, south, east, west, the gospel is absolutely unique. It is absolutely on its own, and everybody hates it. 
because it makes absolutely no sense to anyone. It contradicts every system of thought in the world. It contradicts the heart of every culture in the world, every worldview in the world. It offends everybody. And folks, here's the thing. If it offends everyone, if you have, if you have received its power, if, you have, if, you have, or, 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 if you've accepted it, and you believe it, then you are keenly aware that it offends everybody because you've been offended by it. But God has brought you through that offense to believe and to accept. But now you know not everybody's where you are. And so the temptation is to just kind of back away, especially under pressure from other people. And, and, and here's the thing. that I just, This is a, a little bit free, okay? But understand, shame is a cultural experience. Shame is a community experience. If I am isolated, this is why people, when you feel shame because of things that have happened in the past, what you want to do is isolate yourself from people because the last thing you want is for people to find out what you've done or what's happened to you because you're afraid of how that might change their opinion about you. Shame is ultimately about the fear of how people are going to respond when they find out who I really am. Which means, by the way, here's the free part, shame is a, it's kind of a community thing, right? It's felt in community, which also means it is only truly healed in community, right? If you don't believe it, just look at what Jesus did to people who felt shame in the New Testament. You remember the, you remember the woman who stuck up and just touched the hem of his garment? Because she was ashamed. She didn't belong there. What did he do? He pulled her into community. He's like, I'm not letting you get away with that. Who touched me? Who touched me? I got something to say to you in community with all these people around me. And, and you see what it does is it not only heals her body, but it heals her heart. It brings her in and makes her accepted. That's the antidote to shame. But for us on, on the inside, we're looking around and going, man, this message of the gospel, it is, it is negative in some ways. It's hard. It's simple. And people are offended by it. And so maybe we, we, we feel like we need to tread lightly because I, I might offend other people and, and it's it, the, the issue is, I am ashamed. Because of what other people might say. Uh, by the way, other times when this word is used in the New Testament, it comes up in Mark chapter 8 when Jesus says, hey, if you want to follow me, you need to give up your life, right? Because he who loses his life will find it, and he who keeps his life will lose it, right? And then he goes on to say, for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, will the Son of Man also be ashamed when He comes in the glory of His Father and with the holy angels. In other words, shame is connected with this idea of the potential for persecution. In the face of potential persecution, in the face of potential suffering, am I willing to deny myself? Am I willing to take up my cross? Am I willing to give up my life? Because I judge Jesus to be worth the cost. It comes up again in 2 Timothy chapter 1 where Paul says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our, of our Lord Jesus, nor of me his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us. And then Paul goes on to say, I am not ashamed, for I know who I, am, who I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Folks, the opposite of being ashamed is having full confidence that even though I may suffer now, it will be worth it all. That Jesus is worth whatever suffering I may endure, whatever, whatever persecution may come my way because of the testimony of the gospel. Being ashamed, on the other hand, is to judge, essentially, that Jesus isn't worth the price. And especially in the temptation where, where we're surrounded by people and afraid they might find out what we believe in, and they might respond negatively. Being ashamed is to judge that he is not worthy of such embarrassment. Folks, the Gospel is power. And Paul was so convinced of his power that he said it can free you from shame.
His power is unstoppable. It's where we want to put our faith, by the way, is in an unstoppable power. It is a hope that does not put us to shame, as Paul says in Romans chapter 5, because the love of God has been poured into our hearts. The world can't stop it. God has done it. And it is unstoppable. And so I can't help but wonder sometimes if our lack of enthusiasm, if part of the reason why we are not eager to preach the gospel to other people is if we, for some reason, as Christians, as those who have put our hope and faith in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, aren't really ourselves fully convinced of its power. That sometimes, and maybe oftentimes, we're looking around at life, and life is pretty hard, and we're faced with all these challenges, and and we just can't seem to get on track, and we're plagued by internal doubt and insecurities and anxieties, and, and so we just sit back and then wonder, well, what, like, I'm still asking the question, what power is available for me? What, what is going on with me? What, what difference does the gospel make with me? And so that makes me really insecure if I then come to you and say, hey, I found this power. If I have fundamental questions about what the gospel can do for me, it's going to affect my security in sharing it with you. And so folks, I think we're good at identifying sometimes, why don't, why don't, we, why don't we share the gospel? Well, we're, you know, fear of man. Yes, but where does that come from? I was with someone this last week, because that's what they said. Like, what we have to realize as human beings, everything we do comes from somewhere, right? We're afraid of people. Why? Where does that come from? Well, in part, I think it comes, particularly when we're talking about the message of the gospel, it comes from a deep-rooted insecurity that the gospel is, in fact, the power of God to save souls. And if we're insecure in here, I'm definitely going to be insecure out there. I'm going to second guess. I'm going to question. Is this what they really need? Is it what they want to need? Is it what they want to hear? And I'm going to be tempted to shame. But folks, Paul says the power of God in the gospel is such that it frees us from shame. Do you understand its power? Do you grasp its significance? Its significance. It is the power of God. It, so, so what then, the, the, the question that comes out of that is, what is this power directed towards? And Paul says, hey, it is the power of God for what? For salvation. To everyone who believes. The Jew first, and also to the Greek. By the way, when he says Jew and Greek, that's just another way for Paul to say everyone. Everyone, right? No one gets left out. No one is beyond the reach of the power of this news. Maybe you're wondering if this good news really could be for you. Maybe you're just so used to bad news and good news is for other people. Like, I never get good news. I only ever get bad news. Or maybe you feel so much shame because of the things that you've done or that have been done to you that you have a hard time believing that you could deserve such good news. But folks, listen, I want you to hear this. Part of the reason that this is good news is that it is equally powerful to save anyone. And what makes that possible is that it is received by faith. Here's why this is significant. This means that the Gospel is not walled up behind an ethnic barrier or a national barrier or an economic barrier or even a religious barrier. In other words, you don't have to become a Jew to accept Christ, right? There's no national barrier. You don't have to move to America to become a Jew. And become a Jew. Become a Christian. Either or. You don't have to be either or. You don't have to have a certain economic level. You don't have to be able to give a certain amount in order to become a Christian. There's not even a religious barrier. You do not have to come to church. There's not a whole list of religious things that you have to do. You don't have to go join a monastery. 
It's not walled up behind a religious barrier. In other words, folks, you do not have to become something other than you are in order to receive this power. Let me say that again. You do not have to become something that you are not already in order to receive this power. In fact, the beauty of this good news is that you come as you are in order to be made what you ought to have been. See, it's the complete opposite of every other world religion. Every other world religion is like, do, 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 become, and then you get. And Christianity is like, no, 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 you get, and then you become. It is the freedom of the grace of God made available through the gospel. It's part of the uniqueness of Christianity. You do not have to become holy to get God. It is news, not dues. And the news tells of a Savior who gladly accepts sinners, forgives and transforms them. And all of this available by faith alone. Folks, it's so important that we understand this truth that Paul repeats it three times in these two verses alone. He says it is, it is the power of God to everyone who believes. And then he says the righteousness of God is revealed in verse 17 from faith for faith. It was a pretty weird phrase. A lot of debate about what exactly that means. I just think it's, it's this simple. I think what Paul is saying is it's all about faith. The righteousness of God is revealed to us and it's all about faith. It begins with faith and it builds faith and it just keeps building faith all the way through. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's such an important point because Paul knows our inclination will always be towards a work payment system of living. We will always tend to see our relationship with God as a transactional relationship. You know what that means? If I see my relationship with God as a transactional relationship, then what that means is I'm going to look at, at how my week went and, and whether I was really, really good and did everything right. Um, if, if that's the case, then I'm going to expect that everything is going to go right and go well in the things that I am doing. And when things do not go well, then I look back at my week or my day and I go, there must have been something that I did wrong because I probably deserved that. Right? That is a transactional relationship between me and God whereby I, even though I have entered into His household by faith, I am now attempting to stay there and earn more of His grace and favor by what I do. And we're always looking at what is happening, good or bad, and determining whether or not God is punishing me or whether He is rewarding me. And our relationship with God is consumed as a transactional relationship. It's how we view it. And let me tell you folks, if that's the way you view your relationship with God, you're going to end up really, really frustrated. See, it's good news because it's, it's, a, it, it's a relationship not based on transaction, but based on grace. Right? And, and, and that's good news because the really bad news is the wages of our sin is what? Death. If we want a transactional relationship with God, then God says, fine. But all those who live by the law shall what? Die by the law. Why? Because by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in my sight. If you want a transactional relationship with God, you can have it, but you will regret it. The gospel is good news precisely because it is received by faith and not by works. For by the works of the law, no flesh is justified. And by the way, this is a temptation again, not just for those coming to Christ for the first time, but for those who have known Him for a very long time. 
Folks, you will drive yourself crazy when you believe that you did everything right. And here's where it really, right, like the rubber meets the road, okay? You ready? Here's where the rubber meets the road. It's when you believe you've done everything right. And like, 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 not like perfect. Like, we're never perfect, right? But like you look back and go, I don't know if there's anything I would do differently. And yet it all fell apart anyway. Man, you'll drive yourself crazy. Why would God do such a thing? What did I do? To deserve that. What did I do to deserve this? Everything should have gone well. Or to drive yourself crazy on the other end going, yeah, I, I just deserve this all the time. This is just who I am. I'm a screw up. I'm a mess up. So of course this is the way life is supposed to go. And folks, at every step along the way and every thought along the way, you are missing Grace. And, and it's just confusing as all get out to you that Jesus would say, come and take my yoke upon me because my yoke is easy and my burden is light and I will give you rest for your souls because you're like, this is madness. I can never just sit and rest. Because what will happen is you're going to do things and, and maybe you're like, man, I got it all right and it went well. And so what's that going to do? That's just going to reinforce the notion that now I have to work. Now I have to work harder. I have to keep going. Because if I rest, if I stop, if I fail, if I slip up, if I mess up, God's going to get me for it. So if I want blessing, I just have to keep going. And folks, do you realize that not even Jesus ministered that way? You ever just read through the gospel and looked at how many times Jesus just left? How many times in the midst of successful ministry outbreaks, he just disappears into the wilderness? We need rest. But folks, you will never rest if you don't understand grace. Because the only alternative is work. It's the only alternative. And this doesn't mean that as Christians we just sit on our hands and do nothing. I mean, like you're like, hey, uh, Bo, <laughs> all right, that all sounds well and good, but just 45 minutes ago you were telling us that the church needs servants. Yeah, right? <laughs> it doesn't mean we just sit on our couches. Watch Netflix and read the Bible. Right? Jesus says it is a yoke. Right? You're going to work. But it's not your work that defines you. It's not what you do that defines you. It's what Christ has done that defines you. It's who He is that defines you. Right? It is the power God, for your salvation, not just from hell, but from the hell of work to earn favor. The hell of anxiety and insecurity of a transactional relationship with a God we can't even see. We sang a minute ago, Lord, take, take my thoughts, my attitudes, and just just put him in the presence of your glory, right? Purify him in the presence of your glory. Do you know, do you understand how uncomfortable that is? Whose thoughts can stand up to that kind of scrutiny? You're always going to find a misplaced motivation, right? And we need it, we want it, we want that purification. But it cannot be the basis of my relationship with him. It's not transactional. It's grace. Not the end of the sermon, but it's going to be the end of the message, okay? Because we still have the Lord's Supper. By the way, he ends by saying this. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Not transaction. Not works. Live by faith. Here Paul's reaching all the way back to that weird little book of Habakkuk. And he's quoting it for us to show that it has always been about faith. The Old Testament law was not about proving oneself worthy of salvation by keeping all the rules. No, it was about demonstrating faith that God would one day make a way through the Messiah to cleanse away sin rather than simply cover it with the blood of bulls and goats. 
So the gospel is the power of God written down in human language so that everyone who reads and believes will be saved. Next week, by God's grace, we'll finish verse 17 because it's confusing. And if we're not careful, would seem to contradict everything we just said. But if understood correctly, we'll discover it is a glorious truth. And the question it's going to ask is how? How can news bring about salvation? And the answer is very simple. You can chew on this this week. The reason it can do so is because through that news, the righteousness of God is revealed by faith and for faith. We'll talk about what that means next week. But for now, folks, Christian, learn the gospel. Learn the gospel. Say, well, I know it, right? Yeah, I know. So do I. I could share it with you in great theological detail. But you know what I find in my own heart? I don't really know it sometimes. You know why? Because I can really easy slip into a transactional relationship with God. I can really easy enter into this give and take barter system, right? I'll do this for you and expect that you're going to do that for me. Give and take. I'll do this so I'm accepted. I'll do this so I'm blessed. I'll not do that so I am not punished, right? I very easily slide into that way of thinking. Which is why, by the way, Paul says, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. You are reading this letter. You Christians sitting in the pew of the church you're in right now, you need to hear the gospel. You need to rehearse it to yourself every single day. Why? Because the inclination of our hearts is always going to lead us to work. And the gospel is always calling us to faith. It's a grace that is received by faith, not by works. Folks, that's the kind of power we don't need to be ashamed of. That's the kind of power that frees us from shame. If I'm coming to you and go, hey, work, 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 I might be a little bit more hesitant. But if I'm coming to you and going free, transformative, saving grace, what a power. It's a power that can't be stopped. It's a power we should lean into. Consider every day. And it's a power, by the way, that we're going to celebrate as we partake of the Lord's table together. This, what we are about to do, Jesus says, you do this in remembrance of me. In other words, this is our opportunity to reflect on the person and the work of Jesus who stands at the center of this good news. It's an opportunity for us together to be reminded that we are now members of the household of God with a seat at His table. Because of the power of the Gospel. We didn't earn this seat. We didn't work for it. We were born into it. You're a new creature. You've been made alive by this power of the Gospel. We're going to celebrate it together. We're going to give you an opportunity, though. I'm going to have the worship team come forward. We're going to sing in just a moment. But before we do, I'm going to give you an opportunity just for silent reflection. Once again, just to, you know, Paul says, hey, don't don't come to this table lightly. When, When you come, examine your heart. 
not, not to see whether your transactions are all in a line. But come to, to make sure your heart is worthy of this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, which means to make sure you're coming in faith. I don't want to come to this table with a transactional idea in my mind. But somehow by coming to this, God's now going to owe me something. I just want to come by faith and receive His grace poured out in my heart. The love of God poured out in my heart that will not make us ashamed. So let's pause and let's reflect. Let's converse with God for a moment. Let's deal with Him. And set our hearts on this gospel. Let's bow and let's take a moment. Lord, I want to thank you for the gospel. I want to thank you for your power that you have put in play for our salvation. That you would even think of us should blow our minds. And that you have engaged your power for our rescue. You've put it in words that we might read and hear and understand and believe. Lord, faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the words of Christ. So God, I thank you for this gospel that has given us life, that has brought light to our eyes, that we can see these wondrous truths in your word and believe. God, we don't always live up to them. And for that, we confess we're not worthy of such salvation. We are not worthy of such grace. But Lord, in that confession, we find true freedom. Because this is not news to you. You know who we are. And yet you love us anyway. So God, I thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. I thank you for his body that was pierced and beaten. I thank you that upon him was poured out the wrath of God, that he drank the cup of wrath to its final drop for us. Lord, I thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.